Even though I revived the BMW R25 with a fresh cylinder head rebuild, I had a feeling it needed more work. So it was time to dive deeper into what really makes this bike move. Today we'll focus our attention to the engine by removing it, securing it on a proper stand, and disassembling it to uncover its inner workings. Join me as we explore 74 year old engineering one piece at a time. To start the disassembly I'll remove the valve cover clamp nut which secures the valve covers to the cylinder head. This exposes the top end of the engine including the rocker arms that control the opening and closing of the valves. This engine features a simple design with just one intake and one exhaust valve while some engines have more. Each rocker arm is held down by two nuts fastened onto the cylinder head studs. Since rocker arms can be tight on the studs, they may need a gentle pull to remove. Once removed, you'll notice an oil passage on the left, which directs oil into the small pipe. This system lubricates the rocker arm assemblies. With the rocker arms out, we can remove the push rods, which transfer motion from the cam followers to the rocker arms. Next we'll remove the cylinder head studs, a design feature that was only in production for a short time. They consist of a cylinder head stud, a machined washer, and a spacer sleeve. With all fasteners removed from the cylinder head, I will disconnect the spark plug wire allowing us to lift off the cylinder head. Now the top of the piston is exposed and it looks relatively oily. Most of that oil probably came from the cylinder head, but some could have also came from the crankcase. To fully reveal the piston, I'll remove four nuts securing the base of the cylinder. Before taking it off, I'll give it a quick scrub to prevent any dirt or debris falling inside the crankcase. Slowly lifting off the cylinder jug reveals the connecting rod and piston. Placing a wooden block underneath the piston prevents the connecting rod from hitting the engine block. With the cylinder removed, we can see the classic Neural brand 4-ring piston. Modern pistons typically use a 3-ring design which is now more common. Next we'll remove the cam followers which sit inside their respective guides. The left side follower is from the exhaust side while the right side follower is from the intake side. At first glance, I can see noticeable wear on the intake cam follower's surface. It hasn't been rotating as it should. Cam followers are designed to rotate to reduce localized wear, extend lifespan, and minimize friction and noise. Unfortunately, this one didn't rotate properly and it wore itself down over time. Continuing with the teardown, we'll remove the wrist pin circlips and the wrist pin, which connects the piston to the connecting rod. By heating it up to around 100 degrees Celsius, I can push the wrist pin out by using a 12mm socket. With the wrist pin removed, we can see the top end of the connecting rod, including its pressed in bronze bushing. Now that the top end is fully disassembled, let's move on to the ignition and generator components. The black generator cover is secured by two M4 screws. Removing it reveals critical electrical components that provide spark and keep the 6 volt battery charged. Before removing any bolts, I'll apply CRC knocker loose to help loosen them off. Breaking small bolts here would be a nightmare. Drilling and retapping M2 or M3 threads is the last thing I really want to do. While that soaks in, I'll remove the spark plug cap, which is in surprisingly good condition for its age. Next, I'll unbolt the ignition coil and try to feed the wire backwards. The points are connected to the primary winding through what might be the smallest bolt on this entire engine. The condenser is also part of this connection. It helps suppress arcing and ensures a clean voltage collapse for the proper spark generation. For reference, this engine rotates clockwise when viewed from the generator side. Now to free the ignition advance unit, I'll loosen its securing bolt by turning it counterclockwise. This is a special bolt that threads into the crankshaft about 75mm deep inside the housing, which explains its length. Now I can pull off the ignition advance unit. The points plate comes off next with the condenser attached to it. To release the carbon brushes, I'll remove the thrust spring tension. With that done, the brushes slide right out. The generator housing is held in place by three filicer screws around the perimeter. These are usually very tight as they've likely never been removed since the bike was new, so be very cautious if you're doing this at home. After applying a bit of heat to the engine housing, the cover comes off, exposing the alternator rotor. Now it's time to remove the rotor using an M8 bolt that pushes against the crankshaft. This effectively pulls the rotor off the tapered fit of the crankshaft. 
As I continue disassembling the engine, I'll apply penetrating fluid to the bolts before loosening them. I noticed these bolts were extremely tight and had some sort of silicone-like material on them. To reduce the risk of stripping the threads, I'll apply heat to the housing, which should soften this unknown material. While the cover is still warm, I'll remove it from the engine block. This exposes the timing components, including the crankshaft and camshaft sprockets, which are connected by a simplex timing chain. At first glance, I notice there is no timing chain tensioner, and the chain is extremely loose. It moves at least 10mm up and down, which is way too much. This issue can cause all sorts of problems, so we'll address it during the full engine rebuild. Now let's remove the crankcase breather. This rotating component is timed to the camshaft and allows the engine to vent only when necessary by the means of a a dowel pin. It shows some buildup and grime, but nothing major for an engine with so many miles on it. I feel a bit embarrassed about the next part. I rotated the engine and didn't see the master link on the chain, so I assumed it didn't have one. Since the original BMW Slash 5 models didn't use a master link from the factory, I decided to grind off the pins of the chain with a Dremel. I punched the pins out, and guess what? There was a master link the whole time. I should have seen that. Before we can remove the camshaft, we need to access the oil pump drive gear and pull it out. This gear meshes with the camshaft. If you try to remove the camshaft without taking it out, you'll break something big time. Now I'll remove the two filister screws through the camshaft sprockets access windows. The camshaft is supported by two radial ball bearings which are held in place by an interference fit within the engine block. Using heat and a DIY puller is the safest way to extract the assembly. Once the engine block is at 70 to 80 degrees Celsius, I start pulling using a bolt threaded into the camshaft. The camshaft finally slides out and the rear bearing looks like it was about to fail. I guess I'm really lucky. The front crankshaft ball bearing which supports the alternator rotor needs to be taken out. For this I'll use a simple split bearing puller which works effectively. Behind the bearing there is a spring washer that compensates for the timing cover's fitment when installed. A snap ring holds the timing sprocket securely onto the crankshaft. The crankshaft sprocket is press fitted onto the crankshaft and it's incredibly tight. To remove it, I heat the sprocket to at least 150 degrees Celsius and use a power steering pump puller to press it off. Once you hear a distinct pop or feel movement, you know it will continue coming off. In some cases, reheating the sprocket while pulling it off can make the process smoother. Behind the sprocket, there's another spacer ring that ensures perfect alignment between the crankshaft and camshaft sprockets. At the rear of the engine, we have more components to remove including the clutch assembly and flywheel. Since this engine produces a maximum of 12 horsepower, the clutch pack is secured to the flywheel by only 3 M6 bolts. To release the spring pressure, I remove one bolt at a time and replace it with a longer M6 by 50 mm bolt along with an additional nut. Backing off all three bolts gradually loosens this assembly. Once fully removed, we can see the compression ring, fiber clutch disc, and pressure plate. Behind these components, there are three coil springs. Normally, modern clutches use a diaphragm spring, but in the early 50s, this design wasn't yet in use. Pretty cool, right? Now we're left with the flywheel, which is secured to the crankshaft by a single 36mm nut. Before loosening the nut, I must first bend back the securing washer and flatten it completely. Once again, I had to get creative to prevent the flywheel from rotating counterclockwise while loosening the 36mm nut. For this, I'm using a 7 8 deep socket braced against a half inch bar. The bar is secured to the engine mounting stand, ensuring a stable removal process. 
Surprisingly, the nut wasn't as tight as I expected. It will definitely need to be torqued to a higher specification upon reassembly. With the nut loose, I'll leave it threaded onto the crankshaft but backed off by a turn or two. Next, I'll remove the flywheel which requires the use of a puller. For this, I'm using a flange puller to extract the flywheel. This one came off smoothly without much force and keeping the nut on was a good precaution in case the flywheel popped off suddenly. Behind the flywheel, I immediately noticed signs of oil leakage past the seal. There's also a spring washer behind the crankshaft which helps compensate for engine clearances between the rear main bearing and the flywheel. At this point, we're already more than halfway through the engine disassembly since there aren't many components left. Next, I'll remove the four bolts securing the main bearing flange to the main bearing carrier. Then, I'll pivot the engine block into the vertical position allowing me to heat and remove the main bearing carrier from the housing and the crankshaft simultaneously. Once again, I'm using the flange puller but this time with two custom brackets I made for the task. With a bit of patience, the carrier comes off cleanly without any damage. Now we get our first look at the crankshaft and the oil slinger. More on that later. I left this part of the teardown for later in the video because I had a feeling it would get really messy. A quick cleanup around the M6 bolts is necessary to ensure the 10mm socket fits properly. Then I slowly back them out taking care not to strip any threads around the oil pan. It's very common to have to repair these threads as they tend to strip very easily. The oil pan needed a bit of persuasion with a rubber mallet before breaking free from the engine block. I did my best to catch all the sludge and grime to avoid making a massive mess and it worked out quite well. Whatever was inside this oil pan was just nasty and I'm really glad I tore into this engine at the right time. After a quick cleanup, the underside of the engine looks surprisingly healthy. The oil pickup strainer on the R25 features a fine mesh screen and is bolted directly to the oil pump. First, I bend back the securing tabs before removing the M6 bolts. The strainer feels heavy and I suspect it's packed with grime and it'll definitely need a thorough cleaning. Next, I'll remove the oil pump from the engine block by removing two additional M6 bolts. There's also a baffle inside the engine which I'll take out to make cleaning the engine block much easier later on. For the final stages of the assembly, I will insert a slide hammer adapter that I retrofitted to fit into the crankshaft. Once tightened and ready for use, I will place a wooden block to support the front of the crankshaft before applying any pulling force. This setup allows me to pivot the engine block, heating the area around the rear main bearing without the crankshaft exerting downward pressure. Although removing the main bearing carrier earlier may have seemed counterproductive, this approach prevents the need to heat the entire engine block at once for the crankshaft removal. With the engine block in a horizontal position, I heat it up to 80 degrees Celsius, then rotate it 90 degrees and quickly install the slide hammer. After a few firm pulls, the crankshaft is freed from the housing. With a slight maneuver, the crankshaft can also be fully removed from the engine block. With the crankshaft removed, we'll take out the flywheel key, which appears to be slightly loose within its groove. Next, we'll use a bearing puller to remove the rear crankshaft bearing. It comes off smoothly but isn't too loose either, meaning it has a good fit. Once removed, you'll find a spring washer behind the bearing. Don't forget about that. At the front of the crankshaft sits the oil slinger, BMW's answer to an oil filter back in the day. Contaminants in the oil are flung into this shaped disc where they accumulate while clean oil is supplied to the crankshaft's pin. This system then lubricates the big end of the connecting rod. Not a bad design, but it does make cleaning a challenge. Here you can see me using a bent wire tool to clean out the slinger, removing years of grime. It's not something you want to see, but it's reassuring that this engine is finally getting a full service after so many years. With the oil slinger cleaned, I still have a few more parts to remove including the chrome cam follower guides. To do this, I heat the engine block to at least 80 degrees Celsius and remove them using a 30mm box wrench. These are extremely tight, so be careful if you're attempting this yourself. 
The final part of the disassembly is the rear crankshaft seal. To remove it, I use two different sized discs and a drift tool to tap it out toward the flywheel side of the engine block. With the seal removed, I now have all the parts laid out on the table ready for cleaning and inspection before reassembly. New parts will be added to the list as this engine is undergoing a full mechanical restoration. More BMW R25 content is coming soon, so stick around.